When it comes to speeding, many of you will have heard of the 10% plus 2 rule. Many of you might even think it's built into legislation. I've even heard police officers say it's built into legislation. But I'm afraid that's just not the case. But that's what I'm talking about today. But first of all, if you're new to me and my channel and you've got questions of your own, I'm a barrister who helps you understand law. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future videos. So as I said, there is no legislative basis for the 10% plus 2 rule or when you are likely to be summoned to court rather than being given a fixed penalty. Rather, these are based on guidelines. For example, the Association of Chief Police Officers, the ACPO, have various guidelines as to when they are more likely to have a driver summons to court as opposed to giving them a fixed penalty. For example, on a road that has a speed limit of 20 miles an hour, you are more likely to be summons to court if you are caught doing 35. Whereas if you're on a road with a 30 mile an hour speed limit, you're more likely to be summons to court if you are caught doing 50 miles an hour. In a 40, you're likely to be summons to doing 66. At 50, you're likely to be summons doing 76. At 60, you're likely to be summons doing 86. And in a 70, you're likely to be summons doing 96. Now, as I said, these are guidelines and they will not replace an officer's discretion as to whether or not you are summons to court. For example, if you are not just speeding but you're also driving dangerously, you're likely to be summoned to court for both. You may also be surprised to hear that the guidelines for driving tolerance are actually relatively low. In a 20, the tolerance is just 22. In 30, the tolerance is just 32 and so on. If you want to learn more about the process of an NIP, a Notice of Intended Prosecution, see my video linked in the description below. So talking about speed limits, I'm actually adamant at sticking to all of the speed limits all of the time. In fact, I've had debates with friends of mine who simply don't believe that I stick to all of the speed limits all of the time. But what I do is I get up to the speed limit, I set the cruise control and I leave it there. Obviously looking out for any hazards, which would cause me to disengage the cruise control and slow down. One of the alternatives that's sometimes offered is a driver awareness course. Again, this is covered in the guidelines. What they try to do is to educate drivers as to the consequences of driving at speed or unfit through drink or drugs. And coming from someone who's done a lot of work, that means I see a lot of the consequences of somebody driving at speed or unfit through drink or drugs. I can tell you that I certainly take the speed limits seriously. But not a week goes by that I don't see a motorbike or a car flying past me in the outside lane doing horrendous speeds, narrowly avoiding collisions with other vehicles or other people. So this is really my way of urging you to stick to those speed limits. As a matter of fact, a couple of days ago, had I not been doing the correct speed limit, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to ease off the accelerator, gently apply the brake, to avoid this guy who pulled out straight in front of me, clearly knowing I was there, but driving dangerously, thought he was going to take a chance, pulled out in front of me and off he went. But on so many occasions, just the few miles an hour difference in your speed can make the difference between easing off the accelerator and having that collision. But it's not just the potential of collisions and dangers on the road that can cause you difficulty. If you've racked up nine penalty points on your driving license through fixed penalties for one thing or another, one single and perhaps minor speeding violation could get you another three points. This pushes you over to 12 points. This means you will be summoned to court because you've reached this threshold of 12 points, which means the court is obliged to ban you for a period of a minimum of six months, unless you can show exceptional hardship. So let's look at what might follow in that scenario. Let's assume that you can't show exceptional hardship, the court does ban you for a period of six months, and you lose your driving license for that period, and let's also say that your job involves driving and your contract of employment says that you must have your car available, you must have a clean license, and if not, you'll be dismissed from employment. In this scenario, there's a very real likelihood that you'll lose your income from your job and all of the consequences that follow. Let's say for a moment that you are the sole earner of the household and you have mortgages and other bills to pay. If you've lost your only source of income, obviously you're going to fall very quickly into mortgage arrears, other bills kind of arrears, and before you know it, your mortgage lender might be pushing for repossession of your house. You may also have a family fallout because perhaps you've had arguments about speeding in the past. Perhaps your partner has been angry with you with all of the points that you've racked up previously. So very quickly, this whole situation can spiral out of control from what seemed to be a one-off incident. 
So as I said, and without becoming too much of a lecture on speeding, please think about the speed limits that are in place. They are there for a reason. 20 miles an hour in particular is usually around schools and other well-built up areas. They are set for a reason. And again, if you've received an NIP and you want to know more about that, the link is in the description to my other video, so check that one out. And of course, there'll be many more follow-up videos, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next ones. Leave me your comments and questions and I'll come back to those soon. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.